Good luck on your test tomorrow. Here's your study guide to answer key. First topic is the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic, you're going to remember the PR in prokaryotic is similar to the PR in primitive. Prokaryotic cells are primitive. They are one-celled, big, or unicellular. They have no nucleus to wrap up their DNA, so it's just loosely floating around in the cell. And an example of that would be a one-celled bacteria. Eukaryotic cells, the way you can remember that is that you are eukaryotic, you are more complex, you're larger, and you have a nucleus in all of your cells. You have a lot more complicated organelles as well. So all plants and animal cells are eukaryotic. The difference between plant and animal cells is that plant cells have everything that animal cells have, plus a cell wall, a chloroplast, and a large central vacuole. Because they have a chloroplast, they can do photosynthesis. Plant cells tend to be a little bit larger and square in shape because they have a cell wall. Animal cells don't have cell walls. They have little small vacuoles to store water instead of one large central vacuole. Their cell size on average is smaller and they tend to be more circular or blob shaped. Of all the organelles you'll need to know, the nucleus contains the DNA. The ER comes in two forms. You can have smooth ER without ribosomes and rough ER that does have ribosomes. The cell membrane is made of phospholipids and proteins, which act as carrier channels to bring molecules in. It is semi permeable because it only allows certain things in or out of the cell. The mitochondria is not just the powerhouse of the cell. It generates energy in the form of ATP, and it does that by breaking down sugars. The ribosomes are the ones that are actually responsible for assembling amino acids into proteins. The vacuole stores water, nutrients, and other things that could be dissolved. And it also, because it's so full of water in plant cells, it can sustain the structure and shape of plant cells. The Golgi apparatus or Golgi bodies, they are responsible for tagging molecules to be shipped outside of the cells. The cell wall is made of cellulose. It is there for support and protection, but has nothing to do with transporting molecules. And the chloroplast contains green pigments for photosynthesis. For cell transport, there are two types. Active transport involves energy because you're moving molecules from low concentration to high concentration. You're forcing them into a more crowded area. Passive transport is moving from high to low concentration, which does not require energy. The example I gave in class to help you remember that is grandma riding a roller coaster, and grandma's statement was, it's easy to fall downhill. So moving from high to low concentration is easy for cells because it does not require energy. That's the way the molecules naturally want to move to an area that's less crowded. For passive transport, there are four types that we talked about in class. Osmosis is the movement of water. It has to cross a membrane to be considered osmosis. An example that we did in class was the gummy bear lab. You could also talk about how opening your eyes in the ocean hurts your eyes or rinsing out your contacts in bottled water is really hurtful for your eyes. And the reason why is because osmosis is moving water through your eyeball cells when that happens. The second example is simple diffusion. Diffusion is when any molecule moves from high to low concentration, but it does not cross a membrane. So an example of that was spraying Axe in those middle school hallways and having it just diffuse through the entire school or adding Kool-Aid to a pitcher of water, or adding dye to a, uh, a glass of water, and how that will eventually just spread out and become kind of uniform. Facilitated diffusion is when molecules need a little help crossing the membrane. So anything that's really large or insoluble in lipids or fats in the membrane, they're going to use facilitated diffusion protein channels. So um, the example I gave in class to help you remember that is when you're going into Menards, most people go through that little turnstile thing that kind of rotates as you walk through. But if you're in a wheelchair, you would get stuck. You still need to get inside the cell or inside Menards, but you would just go through the swinging door instead. So still passive transport doesn't require extra energy. You're still going from high to low concentration. You're just using a different doorway. Ion channels are a type of facilitated diffusion specifically for positively and negatively charged molecules. And an example would be moving sodium, which is positive, or chlorine, which is negative, into your cells through these special channels that are um, designed to fit things that have a charge. Behind the gummy bear lab as we go over these next couple of things about osmosis. There's three vocab words you're going to need to know, hypertonic, hypotonic, isotonic. So if it is a hypertonic solution, it's going to look something like this first picture here. Hyper, think about a hyper kid. He's had too much sugar. So a hypertonic solution has too much stuff in it, stuff not including water, solutes. So here's a solution that has a lot of stuff in it compared to the inside of the cell. So the inside of the cell, maybe it's a little bit salty. Outside is super salty, like ocean water or something like that. Hypertonic outside compared to what the cell is. So because of that, the water inside the cell has a high concentration compared to outside the cell. 
water is going to leave that cell to try to go dilute the saltier water outside. Hypertonic solutions cause water to leave or go out, resulting in a cell that shrinks. The next one is an isotonic solution right here in the center. The concentration inside and outside of the cell is about equal, and since there's no high or low concentration to move to, water just kind of hangs out. It's doing the same thing. Um, it's not going out of the cell or into the cell, so the cell stays the same size. The third situation over here, the cell is in a hypotonic solution. Good way to remember that is that O in hypotonic is just a big empty space, and the solution outside of the cell is big and empty as well. So there's no solute outside, which means high concentration of water outside compared to inside the cell. What's going to happen is the water outside looks at the cell and says, oh, you poor little thing, you're all salty, let me come dilute you. And so the water comes rushing in to try and balance that out, and in the process, that cell is going to swell up and, in some cases, pop and burst because it's got too much water flooding inside of it. The three types of active transport that you're going to have to know for tomorrow's test are cell membrane pumps, endocytosis, and exocytosis. Cell membrane pumps, once again, it's a protein that stretches across the membrane, but slightly different this time, that protein has to have energy input into it. It will change shape and force molecules to go from low concentration to high concentration. And that process does take energy because the molecules don't want to move that way. So the example that I gave in class was um, those people on the trains in Japan and the doors are about to close, but they still try and stuff like 40 people inside and they're like cramming them all in and people are getting elbows in their ear and stuff like that. So that takes energy and it causes things to change shape. That makes cell membrane pumps a little bit different than facilitated diffusion. Endo and exocytosis are opposites of each other. Endo, think E-N, um, but instead think in. This is cells moving things in. So they see a large molecule that they want, so maybe this is a little piece of algae that an amoeba is going to eat, and they create a little pocket in their cell membrane, and they'll kind of trap it inside of that, wrap it up, wrap their cell membrane around it, and then bring it inside and digest it. After it's been digested, they wrap it up with a little piece of membrane. They call that a vesicle, and usually that little piece of membrane comes from the Golgi apparatus. And then they move that vesicle out closer and closer to the exterior of the cell. The vesicle membrane merges with the cell membrane, and then we release all of those products out of the cell. Last part is the cell theory. There are three parts. You can read them right there. The cell theory is a combination of efforts from many, many different scientists. The first two that are really responsible are Robert Hooke and Anton van Leeuwenhoek. Both of them are the first to see cells, non-living and living cells. And then Rudolf Virchow is the scientist who's responsible for unifying all of the observations about cells into the three parts of the cell theory. Good luck on tomorrow's test. I will see you in class.